Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to ask you first uh, to please mute yourself if you're not already muted. Um, and when you do have a question, you will unmute yourself. We will call upon you later uh, in the morning for that. Uh, I am Christopher M.G. of the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce here at the Bloomington Chamber headquarters, where it is a brisk 65 degrees here in the office. A little, a little bit about me. I am the director of uh, advocacy and public policy here, and I have a little bit of a legislative background. At the end of the last century, I was an intern at the State House, so uh, it's nice to be back doing this sort of work. Uh, I first would like to thank our sponsors who make all of this possible. We have the League of Women Voters, Bloomington, Monroe County, the League of Women Voters, Brown County, the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, and the Brown County Chamber of Commerce. Let's go to the next slide, please. So all of the representatives for Brown County and Monroe County were invited to this particular forum. That includes Senate Districts 41, 44, Representative Districts 46, 60, 61, 62. So we did uh, reach out to Senator Eric Cook, uh, Senator Shelley Yoder, Representative Bob Eaton, Representative Peggy Mayfield, Representative Matt Pierce, and Representative Dave Hall. Uh, the agenda today, next slide, um, just gives us a little overview of, of the program. We want everybody to remember that this is uh, an informative session, not a debate. We will start with each legislature, legislator introducing themselves and providing opening remarks. Participants will be invited to ask questions after all legislators complete their introductions. To ask a question, please send a direct message to the question moderator stating that you have a question. Include your name if it is different from your Zoom identification. Questions will be taken in order they are received and you'll be asked to unmute when it is your turn. Please limit yourself to one question and a one minute time limit. I would encourage uh, questions to be less than that one minute. A timer will be visible on screen um, and I will prompt you if you do go over your time limit. Uh, keep those additional questions in reserve. We will have possible time for that. Uh, community uh, access television, the CATS is recording this session. Uh, each question, uh, let's see, I have all that. Uh, da, da, da. And legislators, you will be limited to two minutes to answer each of the attendees' questions. Um, you can stop sharing the screen now. I think we are about ready to begin. And I think since we are a League of Women Voters, I think it's great to start with Shelly Yoder. Senator Yoder, how are you this morning? Good to see you. Thank you, Christopher. Good morning, everyone. Good to be together. And I am, I had a couple of good weeks. Uh, we're here rounding out the first half of session. We've got two more weeks to have bills heard on in either of the chambers and then all the bills that were heard and passed through those respective chambers will switch sides. And about the first week of March, the Senate will start hearing the House bills and the House will start hearing the Senate bills. I had a little bit of success. I got my first bill successfully out of the Senate this week. It was very exciting for me personally, uh, but more importantly, it actually will do a lot of good for the state of Indiana and even save us money uh, in the end. So it's a, it's a bill that expands access and creates some savings potential for the state of Indiana around long acting reversible contraceptives. And currently in Indiana law code is, a Medicaid patient comes in to her healthcare provider and says, I would like a long acting reversible contraceptive with, in conversation with her healthcare provider, determine that's a great course of action. The order is placed and Medicaid will issue 
that, we'll call it LARC, to that Medicaid recipient. And that LARC is tied to that recipient. So it requires, by the time the LARC arrives at the healthcare provider, put an asterisk there, because I'll come back to that in just a moment, the Medicaid individual has to come back into the office for a second visit for insertion or implantation, depending on the style of contraceptive. And there isn't a great rate of return. Um, you've got anybody, but in particular, Medicaid individuals have transportation issues. Uh, if they have other children, they've got childcare to figure out. If they're working, they're probably working um, maybe multiple jobs. And so they're, they're having to ask additional time off for that second appointment. So those LARCs are sitting there on health providers' shelves going unused, and they do expire, but they're tied to that particular individual. So the clinic is hoping that that Medicaid individual eventually returns before the LARC expires, but more times than not, it expires. And the clinic eats that cost because they do not get reimbursed until it is implanted or inserted. So it's a great deal of, of loss for clinics. And these devices are around $1,000 a piece. Uh, this, my bill would, would enable a LARC to be reissued to another Medicaid individual. So after 12 weeks of waiting on the shelf, waiting for that individual who it's tied to, to return to have it implanted or inserted, if they don't return, then it can be reassigned to another Medicaid individual. So it's uh, incredibly convenient. It can be same day service for individuals coming in uh, and deciding that a long-term reversible contraceptive is best for them. It can be in, inserted or implanted same day. It saves time, it saves money. It passed through the Senate unanimously and it's heading to you, Matt. So I hope I have your support. Um, I have actually doc, uh, the chair of health on the House side. He is one of the co-sponsors, uh, House sponsors for that bill. And I asked him specifically because I want to hopefully make sure it gets a hearing. But I uh, would love your help in getting that uh, through the House. But it's a great bill. It's good policy. And that was my first bill. I have another bill that eases application uh, the application for SNAP benefits for seniors and those with uh, in disabilities that will be heard on third reading in the House, I mean, in the Senate this week. Um, that passed through Family and Children's Services unanimously, so I'm hopeful uh, that it will come to you too, uh, Matt, on the House uh, side in a couple of weeks. And I have a third bill that's going to get a hearing, the um, Climate Task Force, Climate Solutions Task Force. That's slated for a hearing next week. So it's been a great several weeks. And my repeal of mental products tax, it is not dead. And I, I could use some advocacy there. I'm still working. Um, it's, it's, it still has hope. Uh, so those are things that I'm really focused on right now. In Senator, addition, repeat that last one you had. Uh, that are happening. Repeat that last bill that you needed some help on. So the bill that, um, well, you, you can help get a vote on Senate Bill 335, the Climate Solutions Task Force. Senator Niemeyer, who is the chair of environment, he has agreed to hear the bill, but he hasn't agreed to give it a vote. So could use some advocacy there. But the last one is, the repeal on menstrual products. So there are, um, we are, you know, one of the last remaining, over 30 states no longer tax menstrual products. So, you know, we're hanging in there. Uh, for me, I call it blood money appropriately, um, really taxing those who have uterus, uteruses, because there is no equivalent um, for those who do not, who are born without a uterus, there is not an equivalent tax. In the state of Tennessee, uh, in the state of Michigan, in 2020, uh, a 
a group called Period Law did win their case in Michigan that that tax was deemed unconstitutional and that tax was removed from menstrual products. And that group is making their way across the United States. And I'm really pushing and urging uh, the Senate to hear my bill uh, that would repeal the menstrual product tax because it would be a win for Indiana. I would hate to have an outside body tell us that we have to do that when it's the right thing to do right now. So it's it's kind of on life support, but I could use your advocacy in that, um, in that with that bill. I will say this, women pay $5,000 in their lifetime um, for this tax. And it's, I would say unconstitutional. So I'll leave it at that. And I'm anxious to hear what Matt has to say on what's going on over in the house. Well, you, you just, you have, a, I see a couple of minutes. Is there anything on the K-12 education? I know that's a topic of interest that I'm sure we'll get into later, but if you just have sure. any. So um, we have, there are some controversial bills that have been filed and thus far they have not been placed on the agenda. One was placed on the agenda, um, sort of the anti-CRT 2.0 bill it was placed on the agenda and, and then taken off last week. It's not, um, it, it hasn't been released. The agenda hasn't been released yet for education, which is problematic because what we're seeing is there's a more and more and more of a delay. So it's very difficult to educate people, let them know what's going to be heard in the coming week. And it feels strategic to me. Um, you know, I want to have, give people the benefit benefit of the doubt, but it does seem uh, curious why these agendas take so long to be released when all the other committee agendas are released. But I will say that I'm working with the Boys and Girls Club and RBB CSC on a, an issue that's in that community trying to share a building with Boys and Girls Club. We're trying to get an amendment on what is really a terrible bill, but this amendment would make it much better uh, trying to make sure that school corporations can lease a building or part of a building to a nonprofit if it continues the mission of the school, uh, of the school of educating children. Because the bill itself would require a school corporation to sell a building that's not being completely used uh, for a dollar to a charter school. And so that's the bill that's making its way through and we're trying to get it amended to give this other option to traditional public schools to use space that's not currently being used that we know in our district, it's this is a problem, but I have heard from school corporations ac across Indiana that they have the same, maybe they're using a portion of their space to the YMCA, maybe a portion of their space, they're using it for a childcare facility for their teachers. Maybe they're using it for Head Start. So school corporations are doing what the community needs and they don't need a building that taxpayers have paid for to just be sold for a dollar to a charter school that has zero oversight on the use of those dollars. So that is Senate Bill 391. It's up for a vote. Uh, this coming week, I know that's going to be on the agenda because it's amend and vote only. So keep an eye out for that bill, 391. And just real quickly, what are some of these other bills that you uh, noted earlier, just to review for uh, our attendees here today? 254 is the LARC bill. Um, so keep an eye out for that on the House side. Um, it's Senate Bill 252. Um, excuse me, 252. That's my... Um, expansion of contraceptive, long-term reversible contraceptives. Um, Senate Bill 335 is the Climate Solutions Task Force Bill. My, the SNAP Ease of Enrollment for Seniors and Those with Disabilities is Senate Bill 334. So those are bills I'd love your help on. Great, thank you, Senator Yoder. And just a quick reminder, if you have a question, uh, direct them to the question moderator. You do not have to uh, provide your questions or, and write it out just that you have one. Uh, next up, we have Representative Matt Pierce. Good morning, Representative Pierce. How are you? Good morning. Is my audio okay? Hear me Wonderful. okay? Okay. All right. Well, as uh, Shelly mentioned, we are kind of getting down to the end of the first half. So uh, on the House side, 
the deadline to get all bills out of committee and have a committee report adopted on the House floor is Tuesday, February 21. So that's about a week and a couple days. So we're coming down there. And then two days after that on Thursday, February 23rd, that's the deadline uh, in the House to have all the bills passed second reading, which is the amendment stage before the full House. And then all bills need to be passed out of the House on third reading by Monday, February, I think 27th, if I got my date right there, but the end of um, that at least last week of February. And then there's, uh, after that's done, there's kind of a little bit of a halftime. It's kind of funny. It's like everybody goes to their locker room and they kind of rest up for the second half. And uh, so uh, nothing really was going to happen then again until Monday, March 6th, the session will kind of get in the full board. Then the Senate will be handling the House bills and the House will be dealing with Senate bills. And so uh, that's normally how it works. Sometimes uh, a bill will get fast tracked um, and kind of move ahead of that schedule. And we might do a Senate bill before the second half, but um, that's usually fairly unusual. So that's kind of the basic um, timeline there. So I've been um, focusing most of my time in these last couple of weeks on energy issues because I'm the ranking member of the House um, Energy Utilities and Telecommunications Committee. And uh, we've had a lot of bills that are really not good for ratepayers kind of moving through there and uh, moving through that. I think they're probably gonna move through the House, but just to give you a couple examples, um, House Bill 1421 would give um, utilities wanting to build natural gas plants what's called construction work in progress. And so this essentially means that those utilities will be able to begin charging ratepayers for the plant while it is being constructed, even though the plant is not actually providing any energy to consumers. And so um, they've done that for other um, forms of generation as well. Um, you know, some argue that, oh, it's better for the rate payers because you can lower financing costs and it's not like an immediate ramp up of rates when the plant comes online. But there's, you know, been a lot of um, study on it. And what they basically say is not being taken into account is that the risk is being shift, shifted from the shareholders of the utility onto the rate payers. So if something goes wrong with the construction timeline, it gets delayed. Uh, the plant ends up not really being needed, whatever the case might be, the ratepayers are going to eat that instead of the shareholders. And really, all the bills from this session are highlighting what has been the policy of the General Assembly for the last decade, and that is to insulate the investor-owned utilities from any downside. And so the QIP is one example of that um, for gas. Another example is House Bill 1417, which really has me exercised because this is a, has like a really boring name like deferred cost accounting or something, but it has a real impact on ratepayers. So utilities, if they face unexpected um, costs, like for example, a giant tornado comes through or an earthquake or something, and a lot of their infrastructure um, gets destroyed. And so now they got to rebuild it they're able to um, put that on their books in a deferred way and then come into the utility commission and ask for those costs to be um, added to the rate base. Um, and even though it was maybe already covered in the rate case. So when you come in as a utility to rate case, you say, here's what it's gonna take for me to run my system, to maintain it. And that's all built into the rates. And so and normally it's supposed to be covered. But if you have one of these events that's unexpected, kind of catastrophic, then they can come and ask for it. And everybody agrees that that makes sense. You know, if you have, you know, half your substations are flattened by some natural disaster or terrorist attack or something, it makes sense that you got to get it up and running again. Well, in Duke's case, they came into the utility commission and they had already um, calculated into their rate base the cost of maintaining these coal ash ponds that um, they have in Southern Indiana. And they ended up having an extra $200 million to deal with these coal ash ponds. And so they came into the utility commission and they said, hey, you know, we want this deferred accounting thing to get this 200 million in there. And the utility commission said, fine, that's great. Have another 200 million. Some rate payers took the uh, utility commission to court. The case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. 
And the Supreme Court said, yep, Utility Commission, you violated the law because you engaged in what's called retroactive rate making because the coal ash pond costs were already in the rate base from the big rate case. And Duke should have just come back in and, and asked for another rate case if they felt their costs weren't being covered. Now, why does Duke and every utility want to avoid a rate based case as long as they can? That's because in a rate based case, the consumers can come in and say, okay, you may have higher costs to deal with that coal ash pond, but over here, you saved a bunch of money because you put in these smart meter things. You don't have to pay the meter readers to go around anymore, or things are happening in an automated way, or you shut down a bunch of your offices where people used to walk in and pay their bills. You know, And so you can um, basically offset some of the increased costs by arguing that they're cost savings in other parts of their operation. Because remember, utilities don't have competition. They're um, what's considered a natural monopoly. So like it's, you know, they are going to be guaranteed a profit. Just the question is, what is that profit? So uh, when the Supreme Court ruled that that was um, improper retroactive rate making, the legislature has immediately jumped into action and they've got this bill 1417 moving, which essentially says, uh, we're going to overrule the Supreme Court and make sure Duke gets their 200 million. And uh, it's pretty staggering because the bills it's written now. Now, I think that I've been told there's going to be some amendments on second reading. So maybe this will get better as it moves along. But there's a provision in the bill that essentially says, notwithstanding any utility law, so anything in Title Eight of the code, you shall give them this money. And then it has a little line at the bottom of the section that says, um, if you think it is just and reasonable. So when I'm like, you know, basically waving my arms around, complaining in committee, like you are basically just telling the utility commission to ignore all existing utility law to get this money. And, and, they, and then you tell me that we're all gonna be protected by this one little just and reasonable line, which I don't think you will be. So that passed out of committee on a party line vote and that'll be before the house this week. And so that's just an example of where we make sure the utilities get their money up front without having to go through a rate case. Uh, second example of that is um, House Bill 1420, which is also moving. And that has to deal with the building of transmission lines. Now we have to get more transmission lines out there because if we're gonna be moving renewables around and new solar fields and things, you need like these big high power lines to move stuff around. But you've got different types of high, high transmission lines. Some are meant to bring stuff in from other states. Some are meant to just get you from one part of a utility to another. Some from the coal plant in southern Indiana up to Indianapolis. So you have all these different kind of categories. Well, the Federal um, Energy Regulatory Commission uh, quite some time ago said that when you have these you these transmission lines, which are um, determined to be needed by a regional transmission authority. Ours is called MISO. So if basically the guys who try to make sure we have power in all the Midwest say we need some more transmission lines. The FERC people said you have to do an open bidding process for that. So any company could come in and say, hey, I can build and operate that um, most efficiently and cheaply. And the MISO people would run that bid and they would um, put it in service. And then the money would be going to this external company. Well, the utilities don't like that. They want the money and they want that in their rate base. And so they have got this bill moving that gives them the right of first refusal on those things and gives them, it supposedly creates competition by telling them they have to do a bidding process and think about the price, but it's all within the control of the utility. So you're taking it away from a third party, neutral third party and putting it in the hands of an interested utility. Because the thing you have to remember is the utility's profit, its rate of return, is based upon the cost of service. So the more a utility can gold plate the cost of its facilities, the more uh, money it makes. And so if it can get those transmission lines and make them really expensive and build them, they get an even bigger profit. It's a perverse incentive built in to the way utilities are regulated. So those are um, just another example of the legislature doing everything they can to provide money to the utilities, while at the same time they pay lip service to affordability for ratepayers. And I'll just give you one 
example or to kind of juxtapose that. So I think you might remember I've talked about this from time to time. The Supreme Court ruled on net metering. So people who put solar panels on their roofs, they have the right to be compensated for extra energy they feed into the system. The legislature passed a bill several years ago that, that reduced it from a one-to-one -one credit down to like the wholesale rate plus 25%. Never once during that debate do we talk about changing the way you would calculate what the excess energy was, the amount of it. Well, the utility commission went off and let the utilities create this new system of calculating that energy, which really disadvantages the person with the solar panels. That went all the way up to, to the uh, Supreme Court. And uh, the Supreme Court that time said what the utility commission did was okay. And that we think that it's fine under the law. Well. I know that is not what the legislature was thinking. So I offered an amendment to make clear that we're gonna maintain the way we've always calculated that excess, right? Which wouldn't be what the utilities want. Well, my amendment was defeated on the house floor. So they're more than willing to overturn Supreme Court decisions when they disadvantage the utilities. But if there's disadvantage for ratepayers or people who have solar energy, then they're not interested in that. So I've been kind of extra exercised and frustrated about that whole thing. Well, and thank you. I'm way over my time. Mark. Thank you, Representative Pierce. We're going to take questions now. So if you have any, please uh, direct those to the question moderator. First up, if uh, you could unmute uh, Karen Greenstone, do you have a question for our legislators? Good morning. Um, Representative Pierce, would you talk about um, your bill 1472 that has to do with uh, hos uh, high hospital bills, please? Yeah, sure. So as some of you might know, there's uh, there are a couple bills that have been introduced by the Republican majority to try to get at this issue of our hospitals having some of the highest rates. I think we're seventh in the country for hospital rates. And there's a business group I think called Hoosiers for Affordable Healthcare. It's pretty connected and they're really um, pushing the legislature to do something to bring the cost down for these employers. And so the Republicans have a couple bills that are introduced. The problem I think with those bills are kind of taking things off this big long shopping list that this business group came up with. And I think they're really just treating the symptoms and you know, some stuff I support, some I don't, but I don't think it's really gonna solve the problem. So I introduced a bill that would have Indiana move to um, a plan or a system that exists in Maryland. So in Maryland, what they do is they have what they call an all payer system in which each, each hospital's rates for their procedures are set and they apply to every payer for that service. So whether you're Medicare, Medicaid, private pay insurance, the procedure's the same cost. It's not, it eliminates this cost shifting. Then the second thing they did is each hospital gets a, a global budget based on various metrics they've come up with. They've got a, a commission that figures it out. And by the way, the hospitals were involved in devising this system. So what they found is they've, they've saved about a billion dollars. The federal government's been monitoring it because uh, Medicare and Medicaid have to give them waivers. And so there's been quite a bit written about it. And while you can't say nothing in healthcare is a total slam dunk, it looks really promising. And so I think that's a system that would work well here. And they've now moved to like the next phase, which is called total cost of care. But the point is, right now we live in a world where healthcare providers and hospitals make money based on the number of procedures they do. And uh, that means the more they do, the more money they make. Better to have them thinking about how to avoid people having to have procedures because they um, did a better job of caring for them. I see I'm out of time here. Senator Yoder, any comments? No, um, I appreciate Matt filing that legislation. Uh, I would only say that he's right. There are several bills uh, that we've been hearing in the health committee. Uh, one in particular, which is a side of service uh, bill, which is House Bill, I mean, I'm sorry, Senate Bill 6. Uh, as, as it was noted, um, it, it did barely make it out of the health committee. Um, and hospitals um, across the board, uh, the people who are for this um, are definitely your employer-based uh, 
um, I can't even think of the word. Employers are for this because they're thinking that this is going to reduce costs. But the problem is um, that it is going to severely um, and drastically devastate hospitals in the way that um, they, you know, are able to run their business. Um, who wasn't at that table, and you don't see them, they were all doing other things, were the insurance companies. And they were nowhere uh, when we were having this bill debated in committee. And that was, that was noted, you know, they have been silent. Um, and I think without addressing the high cost of, of healthcare in Indiana and not have them be part of the solution because they are certainly part of the problem is, um, is, is too simple of a solution. So Senate Bill 6, it did pass out of committee we were promised it's going to be severely amended or it will die in second reading, but we'll have to see um, if that is six, um, if that actually works. But I don't think that is a uh, good policy for Indiana, Senate Bill 6. All right, great. Next question we have Jim Allison has a question, I believe, about electric vehicle registration. Jim, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, thank you. Um... I've noted that if you drive an electric car, when you come to register it annually, you pay $150 surtax because it's an electric car. I was wondering how that compares with the tax I would be paying at the pump if I were driving a gas powered car and where this $150 actually comes from. I'd like some details about that if you can. Yeah, I can, I can jump in on that, Jim. That goes back to, um, I think it was 2017 when they, you might recall that there was a big transportation infrastructure bill that came through the um, General Assembly and uh, they actually raised the gas tax. And the idea was they were going to create this long term funding stream to ensure they could maintain and, and build a bunch of new roads like I 69. So during the process of that discussion, People said, well, these electric car people are not paying their fair share because when I have my gas guzzler pickup truck and I have to fill up my giant, you know, 40 gallon tank or whatever, I pay a lot more tax, uh, um, gas tax, which contributes to keeping the roads up than when the little Prius shows up and, you know, they fill their tank every month or something. And so uh, theoretically, that, that $150 surcharge is supposed to be some approximation of the gas taxes that you would be paying if you had a conventional um, gas vehicle. And I don't remember um, hearing the methodology they used on that, but believe me, we raised it at the time saying like, look, and this was even before the latest EV car craze. We're just essentially saying, look, if climate change is real, if we wanna to try to get people transition to, you know, zero carbon energy vehicles, we shouldn't be, you know, putting these disincentives in there. We, you know, the federal government, everyone else is providing incentives for people to um, actually buy and drive these vehicles. And that was a disincentive. And so we, we fought that on the Democratic side, but we, we lost that battle. So the Republicans would say it's just fundamental fairness because people with fossil fuel vehicles are paying more in gas tax than someone with an EV. All right, thank you. Senator Yoder, any comments on the EV? No, but I'll just give a little plug for my Bolt. It serves a great purpose for me to go back and forth to Indianapolis uh, every day. So um, I appreciate Matt ex giving some further explanation to that to that fee. Great, thank you for- Thanks for that. the Bolt driver, Jim Allison. <laughs> All right, next up, here we have the B squared zone, Dave Askins. I believe you have a question if you could unmute yourself. Oh, Dave. Well, I don't. Dave, I'll get you next. Is, is Kathy Roundtree with us? Can she unmute with a question? Yes, thank you. I wondered if um, Representative um, Pierce and Senator Yoder could comment on Senate Bill 4, the um, public health bill, um, what your feeling is about that bill and what chance you think it has for passage. 
Thanks, Kathy. I'll go first, Matt, if you're Thanks. okay. So yeah. It's still in the house. Right now it's in appropriations and it is also going to be some amendments are, I would suspect, likely uh, on this bill. For the most part, um, the, sort of the, the, the line fell this way. There were individuals against it, and those individuals were those who were very much, um, I mean, I, I don't want to label people, but I don't know how, sort of that um, group during COVID that uh, I think they got labeled anti-vaxxers, but uh, that's who's really sort of pushing back against Senate Bill 4, saying that this is a government overtake of public health, which it is called public health. And the unique thing about this bill is it does not require counties to participate in this additional funding to a county. It requires the commissioners or a county to decide whether or not to participate in this public health commission. And then the additional money would come. Every county is going to get what they normally get on a, uh, typically, but they would get additional funding if they would participate in this commission. And it's right now it's significant funding. And so there was a group of folks that are loud against this because it sounds like government overtake of public health. It is public health, so yes, we have a role, the government has a role in that. But some of the other concerns would be, um, I know I've heard from IU School of um, the Optometry School, they're concerned that the requirements of the eye test is being uh, diluted and, and at a time when students need that um, higher level of eye exam. So there's some concern there that we're working on an amendment. And there's also an amendment around who can qualify for that local health officer. Uh, now, right now it is a, uh, a physician and that language is uh, being amended some. So we're going to keep an eye out for that. But by and, lar by, by, by and large, it's a good step for uh, Indiana to invest and prioritize this for, uh, for our state. So I'm hopeful that it will successfully get through the Senate and go over to the House. Will the funding be there? We'll have to wait and see. Great, any uh, comments, Representative Pierce? Yeah, I think it's just important to know that kind of the subtext and all this health stuff is, is really COVID hangover. So, I mean, there are two very kind of distinct views of public health departments, right? So for a lot of us, public health departments are out there helping educate people about, uh, you know, not smoking and helping people who are smoking to stop, um, you know, helping um, understand how to avoid diabetes and just have better health outcomes, get kids vaccinated. You know, a lot of things that would make Indiana a healthier state and, by the way, save employers a lot of money because they'd have a healthier workforce. So that's one view of the health departments and what they do. The other view of the health departments is, is an oppressive, kind of overbearing, um, unelected bureaucracy. And this goes back to COVID. So they're the people who um, made people wear masks, told businesses they have to close. Uh, they're the people who show up and tell you that your septic tank is not working and you have to hook up to a sewer system and then cost you tens of thousands of dollars. And there have been like septic wars going on forever. So for people who view public health departments in that context of the people that hassle me, force me to do stuff I don't want, um, you know, let alone people who are skeptical of vaccines, they don't want additional funding in a more robust public health department system. Uh, because they think they're just going to get more of what they don't like. So the question is, who's going to win the day in the General Assembly with that viewpoint? Are they going to view the public health um, departments as the positive um, entity that helps make Hoosiers healthier? Or is it going to be seen as some kind of oppressive, over-regulatory um, entity? And so we'll just have to find out how it comes out. Great. Thank you, Representative Pierce. Dave, is that mic working now? Can we? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, the background noise you hear is uh, is because I'm down here at City Hall for the Black Market. Uh, this is one of the um, events that the City of Bloomington is, has put on for Black History Month. It's an homage to the Black Market that used to stand at the corner of Dunn and Kirkwood, where People's Market or People's Park 
is now. Anyway, that's why the background noise. And I think uh, it turns out that Senator Yoder has probably already addressed most of what I wanted to ask about, namely uh, Senate Bill 4. Uh, and the reason that's on my radar is that at Thursday's meeting of the Board of Public Health um, here in Monroe County, uh, that, that bill got a lot of energetic public commentary from folks who sort of fall into the uh, category of, of people who are concerned about government overreach. And it's not anything that's in the bill right now they're concerned about, but rather the fear of possible amendments, little tweaks that have uh, impacts that only the cleverest of folks could figure out. And so I was hoping maybe you could address um, sort of how you might approach uh, any possible amendments that might have um, a negative effect on what the intent of this bill is as it stands now. Uh, thanks. Senator Yoder, I think that was. What's, what's challenging is much of the fear and well, concern is being driven by just a distrust of government. And there, what, what I was able to hear specifically, there was one of the, one of the commission's meetings early in the summer, uh, some comments were made that struck a nerve with people and it sounded condescending, it sounded uh, heavy handed and <clears throat> that has individuals, the, this, this group of individuals very concerned that the bill says that it's a, uh, a, a voluntary program that counties will have to vote to participate, but the set, and that a county will continue to get the funding that they've always received, that that will not be harmed, but there is a lack of trust that that is actually going to happen. So let's, so the, the idea is let's just defeat the bill because it's, they're, they're not being honest with us. And what's difficult with setting up, trying to look out for amendments is how will they amend it? Because the language is, is just not there. Uh, th this is a complete participate if you want to participate, don't participate if you don't want to participate. Uh, it is a local decision. And so you will have to look for amendments that fix something that isn't there. So that will be interesting. I think, I think what I'm looking for has me concerned is Will there be funding that will make possible the fulfillment of Senate Bill 4? Because if that gets harmed, then much of Senate Bill 4 is, is not going to be successful. It will require, the whole purpose of this is to get funding to address public health concerns in counties across Indiana. So if the funding's not there, then what's the point of having the commission? Because the funding, it's, it's the money and the investment that local communities desperately need. Representative Pierce, comments? Yeah, I, I agree. The main thing is, you know, what, what's gonna be the level of funding, if any? You know, will they meet the governor's um, request? And that's probably the overriding thing. But, you know, when it comes to amendments, I think that essentially the question is, how much will the kind of more um, right-wing public health department skeptics assert themselves to the point where maybe they feel, oh, we're not gonna be able to get this thing passed unless we do something to make those people feel better. So maybe we have to put some more restrictions on what health departments can do over certain subjects. And that I could see that being a possible compromise among Republicans because you gotta remember at least in the house, and I think this is how it works in the Senate too, is now with their super majorities, they go into their caucus and they actually have the real debate within their caucus. You don't really see the debate very often on the house floor before the cameras. It's all happening behind closed doors. And you have the you know most conservative wing of the Republican party fighting with the conservative wing of the Republican party. And they have to assess whether they have the votes after they tell the more conservative members, sorry, you're not gonna get your way, or whether they say, uh-oh, we're gonna need their votes now 
And so we better figure out how to get them. And that's where you start kind of paring the bill down or putting limitations on it. Thank you, Representative Pierce. Just a reminder to our attendees, make sure you're on mute unless you are asking a question. Next up, we have Brooke Moscato. Is that, uh, did I butcher your last name? Brooke, you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Good morning, and thank you for taking my question. Um, I am with Bedford Online, and we have recently started a les legislative watch page on our website. Um, right now, we have highlighted Bill House Bill 1568 um, that would allow pharmacists to prescribe birth control pills and patches to patients instead of a doctor. Um, we've been running a poll for a few days to see how our community feels about it, and the yeses are definitely outweighing the noes. Um, you know, we live in a rural community where we have limited access to healthcare and it can take weeks to get an appointment. So, um, pharmacists have more pharmacology training than doctors in school. So would this, I take this would be a plus for women's health. Um, how do you feel about the bill? I believe last time it was in session, it got, vote. um, it was out one bill before getting passed. Um, do you think it will be passed this time? Well, I haven't heard any discussion at all about um, this bill, and I think it's so I I'd be a little bit surprised if it moved because you have to remember that um, there is a faction within the House caucus that kind of thinks that birth control is abortion, that you're basically preventing pregnancy and that's a bad thing and or that it might promote promiscuity in some way. So those bills are difficult to pass now maybe something might happen because I know that when we had that special session in order to uh, ban abortion, there was a lot of kind of nice talk coming from the Republican side that, oh yeah, we recognize that we're doing something pretty big here. And so we're gonna do all kinds of new supports for women who might find themselves to be pregnant. We're gonna do lots of stuff to make sure that women have access to birth control and other things that would prevent them um, from being in a position where they might wanna seek an abortion. and. So that was kind of the promise they made at the time. And so I don't know if they'll actually make good on that this session or not, but I haven't, I haven't heard much or really any discussion about that at all. But again, I don't serve on the, the health committee. So maybe there's something that I assume that's where that bill went. And so maybe something will happen, but we've got, you know, like a week and two days left for that bill to move. Senator Yutter. Well, I've been talking with the authors of that bill pretty regularly, uh, trying to get updates, preparing for the, in the event it does make it to the Senate, sort of um, making my rounds and fielding questions. You know, it's interesting because I've been thinking about this bill and how much Planned Parenthood served in this role for counties when I was coming of age um, and for so many women and girls that they could go to their Planned Parenthood clinic and have these conversations. And those clinics are few and far between. I think I'm, we're down to uh, what, less than five, I think in, in Indiana. And now with SB1, depending on what happens, really what is the future? of accessing birth control if even those few clinics um, struggle to stay open. So um, I'm hopeful, I'm gonna remain hopeful uh, that the bill does get a hearing and we'll sort of have to see how it's being amended. I know they're working very closely with uh, the Indiana State Medical Association because of course there, there are concerns there, but, um, but we have time it is winding down, but I know those that are working on this bill on the House side are, are working very, very hard, and I'm trying to stay connected to them to see how I can be helpful um, in preparation for it coming to the, the Senate. But that's a little yeah, bit there. I, I should probably jump in. So I just looked at like who's on this bill, and so Representative Railway is um is the author, but also Representative Nagel is one of the co-authors, and uh, she was fairly outspoken in the um in the the abortion session that we needed to do more on birth control and so i'm i'm guessing that they are probably pushing pretty hard behind the scenes to see if they can get something to move and 
it's just a matter of what happens there. And, and Representative Vermillion also, I think, was one of the few um, Republicans who did not vote for the abortion ban. And uh, so she's on that bill as well. And then um, Representative Fleming, who's the, a Democrat, she's an OBGYN from across the river from Louisville um, down there. And she's been pretty outspoken since she deals directly with um, patients in her practice. Well, thank you, Representative Pierce. Uh, next up, we have Amy Oliver has a question. Oh, Amy, can you unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear you? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Um, my name's Amy Oliver. I am on the school board in Brown County. Um, we uh, recently had a referendum that failed. Um, so I'm very interested in the referendum bill that's pending right now and um, efforts basically to make what I perceive is make referendums even harder to um, advocate for and pass. And then I'm also um, wondering about your thoughts on the uh, partisan school board election bills and whether or not you think they ha are likely to pass. Thank you. Well, I don't know what's going on with that bill. I mean, you're right that when they changed the language of the referendum to try to make it look like the taxes are actually going up way higher than they really would. Um, that really was not good. And I know that the, um, you know, school boards and superintendents associations have been trying to see if they can get that fixed. And so um, I don't know if that's um, going to move or not, but that's definitely an issue um, that's out there. And what was the side? I brain faded on the second. I think there was a second issue in there. Oh, the school boards, partisan school boards. Yeah. So um, and there is a bill moving. I understand that it got amended in committee that would, instead of mandating that all school board candidates would have to declare their party and that would be on the ballot like every other um, partisan election, I think they changed it so that each school board would vote. So if your school board wanted to have basically partisan elections for their district, um, they could do that. And so maybe that's a slight improvement, but I think that you know, in a place like Bloomington, if the school board were to make that decision, I don't think you'd ever see a Republican in a very long time on a school board, which is, you know, not a good thing. Because to me, running a school is not really a Republican versus Democrat thing. But, um, you know, when this bill, I was on elections committee last year when they attempted this bill. And I think it was a little bit embarrassing committee because no one was for it in committee or, yeah, uh, other than the author, no one else, everyone else was against it. But I, I never forget, I asked the author, I said, well, what is the most important thing? What is the thing that the voter is going to learn with this R&D label in these school board elections? Why do you think this is so important? And he looked at me and he said, so they will know who the moral candidate is. He was later forced to go around and individually apologize to all the Democrats. So that was kind of interesting. Senator Yoder? Matt summarized it very well but i would just add it does seem to be getting more momentum this session than it did i mean i've only been there for two sessions but last session uh, it seems that you know if 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 it's going to um be successful it's just because it seems that more people are warming up to the idea i had not heard about the amendment that matt uh mentioned but well but I do have concern uh, about, about this and about it succeeding. All right, thank you, Senator. Uh, up next, uh, we have Lisa Freeman. Lisa, can you unmute yourself? Hi there, thank you. Um, I have a question about Senate Bill 486, and that's, um, I'm sorry about the background noise there, um, it was about, taking discussion away from teachers. I'm a teacher and discussion is an important tool that we use monthly. And is there any chance of an amendment for that? Well, we, the Democrats on the education committee on the Senate side had, I wanna say maybe seven uh, different amendments. We tried to get that language amended. Um, my hope is when it goes over to the House, uh, it will get it. It will be successful in getting amended. 
I don't know where Representative Boehning is on this, who, who chairs uh, the House version of education. So I'll let Matt speak to that, but um, we certainly tried to get the language amended and we, we just did not have the votes. So hopefully that change will happen over in the House when it gets there. Thank you for your question. Yeah, so this bill actually is part of like a boom and bust cycle of um, education regulation. So what's been happening, it seems like it's about a five-year cycle, is um, the Republicans decide that there's too much regulation in the schools. We're going to let them just do what they want. We're going to repeal all this stuff. And what you're really talking about is over time, you have lots of mandates that build up. So we say, hey, we want to make sure that we have defibrillators in our schools. So you have to have them there. We want to make sure our kids know about, you know, financing. So you have to teach some stuff about personal finance. We want to make sure um, that kids know about their careers. So you got to talk about these careers. And so over time, you get hundreds and hundreds of requirements on the schools trying to achieve all these goals the General Assembly thinks we ought to do. And then every five years to decide, oh, we've done too much. Let's strip all those away. So in the process of stripping those away, they um, are deciding, oh, yeah, we should also get rid of the requirement that they have to discuss all these various um, issues with their teachers union. Now, you have to understand that uh, the only reason why these discussion provisions are in the law is because the General Assembly several years ago stripped away pretty much all of the collective bargaining rights of teachers. So I think they got it down to where they can kind of bargain about their pay. But as far as working conditions, there was a time when teachers could bargain and could say, okay, what size is the classroom going to be? How many breaks am I going to get? What kind of load am I going to have when it comes to, you know, homework and stuff? And, all, you know, there'd be a lot of things about what's going to happen within the classroom and within the school. That was all taken away. They said, you cannot negotiate for that anymore, teachers. We don't want you involved in that. So during all the pushback, then there's this thing called discussion where you can put into the law like, okay, you're not allowed to bargain. You can't really, you know, try to fight to get down a contract, but we'll just say the school districts have to at least discuss it with you, right? Which of course takes all your leverage away because now you're not bargaining about getting somebody in a contract. You're just kind of discussing it. So now it seems to me a really a step back and a, an even more disrespect for teachers. If we go from, you can't even, you can't bargain for it and now we're going to take away the requirement that you don't even have to discuss it. So the school board could just say that's all off the table, not interested, move on to the next thing. So um, I'm, we'll do my best to try to keep that from becoming law. Senator Yoder, you had an additional comment you wanted to provide. I, it's yes, it's a comment. I just want to say this deregulation bill that it's being called. We're going to remove some of the requirements to make it easier for teachers at the same time that we're passing all of these additional requirements that teachers have to do. But what makes it even more outrageous is all the bills are filed by the same person. <laughs> so the, the argument to deregulate and then the next breath is, but I think they should be doing X, Y, and Z. So Yes, let's defeat 486. So thanks, Matt. Thank you, Senator. I'll just remind everybody and uh, our legislators to just note the bill number. It helps those of us at home following along uh, to understand what the bills include. Uh, next up, we have Commissioner Givens. Uh, Commissioner, do you have a question for our legislators? Yes. Um, there's a lot been discussion about um, the expansion of our convention center here in town, and that's related to food and beverage tax. And so I'd like to know um, what's happening with Senate Bill 37. And if you could talk about that, please. And also I wanna thank both uh, Representative Pearson and Senator Yoder for giving up their Saturday morning to be with all of us. Thank you, Commissioner Githens. Uh, it's an honor to, um, to be here really. Uh, and I would say, so Senate Bill 37. So this is a bill that I personally really worked very hard to change so that Monroe County would not be devastated by the legislation. And they did respond and had been every 
food and beverage tax, if it wasn't going to sunset before 2023, I mean, 2043, it would sunset. We were able to get an additional two years. So that gives us a little bit of time in our community to secure a bond and it will limit it to a 20 year bond. Uh, but that's where we are with the food and beverage tax. But the language also said that going forward, every food and beverage tax will have to have a sunset and it will need to be specific. And I will say, while yes, local control is important uh, and it should be a priority. I know having been a part of the discussion on the county council, I remember this discussion about why doesn't it have a sunset? And it was because that's the way it was written. Uh, we are working off of what was passed in the legislature and why the legislature gets to decide. I think that should be our original question, but, but they do. And um, this idea of the sunset I think it it would have been uh, more palpable had we been able to have that part of the discussion back in 2017, I think when we finally passed it. But we are already uh, hearing and passing very specific food and beverage taxes uh, for communities, Columbus, uh, Maryville. So it's not that they're going away, it's just that they're looking at more specific language and greater transparency on these food and beverage taxes. So right now we've got until 4047 to uh, successfully get our convention center expanded and, um, and going, up and going, our expanded convention center. And that is Senate Bill 37. Representative Pierce, any comments? Yeah, we're just caught in the middle of this you know, effort to essentially rid the state of food and beverage taxes. Now they knew they couldn't come in and just wipe them out. So they decided to put a sunset date on it. And they also recognized that if you were already had bonds let, they were dependent upon that revenue. You couldn't take that away either. So they had to let the bonds play out. What puts um, our county in a tough position is because we don't yet have our bonds let for the project. We don't have that kind of protection of being able to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, um, we can't default on our bonds. So you got to keep our revenue stream going. So that's why uh, it was very um, important that Shelly was able to get that extra time so that perhaps we can, you know, get things rolling and then we'll have a little bit more protection on that project. The issue on whether or not to sunset the food and beverage taxes, I guess it just depends on whether you think that they should be limited to the initial capital cost of constructing a facility or whether you think they should be um, an ongoing tool um, to maybe help later with the rehab of the facility or to um, you know pay for programming or personnel related to it. And so I think the way that food and beverage tax got written is it talks about economic development efforts. And of course, some money does go off to, I think, Ellettsville and some other places that they can decide how they want to use it. I think there's a little bit of division there. Um, so, I mean, it's just a philosophical thing of, do you think that revenue, um, generated by the food and beverage tax will continue to do good things. And maybe 20 years from now, when it comes time to rehab the facility, you already have the revenue stream, or do you want people to have to come back to the legislature each time they have a new project and get that, that approved? So that's kind of just a philosophical issue. Good question. Thank you, Representative Pierce. Uh, up next, we have uh, Christine Glazier. Are you, are you with us here? Christine, got a question for the legislators? Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, the Senate Bill 254, which was authored by Shelley Yoder. And I really like this bill. It's about protecting utility customers. And it has three different important parts in my mind. Um, it would allow utilities, uh, electric utilities, to voluntarily establish consumer assistance programs, which other utilities can already do. Um, it would also require the utilities to report regularly 
um, on any kind of issues that have to do with disconnects on delinquent accounts and so on, so that we know how much of a problem that actually is. And then it also uh, does a lot to protect people who have difficulties paying. So by requiring the utilities to offer payment plans and all kinds of other really good provisions. And I've kind of looked at this bill and I've seen that it's not very popular. <laughs> so it hasn't gotten any co-authors and it's not scheduled for a hearing. And I know that these issues or some of them at least had been uh, discussed in the 21st century energy task force and had not gotten a really great response there from the Republican majority. And so I'm just wondering, is this the first time that something so comprehensive has been offered as a bill? Um, is there any chance if it doesn't make it this time that it could be reintroduced and maybe are there certain parts of it that could be getting more support from the Republicans? So I'd just like to know a little bit about maybe what's going on that I don't know. <laughs> Senator Yoder, you want to take that one first? Christine, you did such a masterful job of giving a, a brief overview of the bill, so thank you. And uh, you're right. I mean, you already have figured out the genius of getting things done. It is the first time I've filed this. Mm -hmm. And I'm new to the Senate, so I'm not sure if this language, I know I worked on this language directly, so it didn't come from anywhere. I mean, we were sort of piecing it together. Um, so where I am right now is I'm trying to find bills that I can take parts of it and amend it onto other bills that might come over from the House. Um, but I'm still going to continue working on it. Um, I, I wish that Senator Cook would come to this. He and I um, are finding ways to work together, and that's been good. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe the whole bill won't be successful, but piecing it apart and focusing on elements of the bill this session as amendments or fixing what seems problematic with the bill and filing it again next session. So I'm still working on it. Um, it's, it's a great piece of legislation. Is it perfect? Well, no, because it, I, I'm not able to get any traction on it. So I'm still going to continue working on it and hopefully get some minor successes this session, but some bigger wins going forward. Thank you. Representative Pierce. Yeah, it's just another example of the investor owned utilities really calling the shots in the General Assembly. So, you know, Shelly and I were like the tag team on the um, energy task force trying to get some of these affordability provisions in the final recommendations. And it was kind of like us against the world and people just weren't interested. So, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that there, there is already in statute the ability for other utilities like water utilities to create their own voluntary affordability programs. Right. But for some reason, the utility, the electric utilities did not want to have that flexibility. And so they made sure they were out of there. They did not want the pressure of somebody saying like, hey, why don't you put together some affordability programs within your rate base to help people who are struggling to pay their energy bills? They also don't really want people to know how many people are getting disconnected and for how long and for over what amount. So they don't like this kind of legislation. Um, at all. But what it would simply just say is, okay, electric owned utilities, if you are investor owned utilities, if you want to do this in the electric space, create your own kind of internal affordability program to help lower income people, you would be able to do that under the law. But um, they apparently don't want even the option to do that. Great. Thank you, Representative Pierce. I don't see any questions. I have one. Um, I'll take the liberty of asking. One of the chamber's priorities is housing, and I noticed um, one of the House bills, the, is it first through nine, Representative Pierce, that are the uh, super majority's priorities, is House Bill 1005. Um, any, any comments on that particular piece of the legislation? It's a housing infrastructure assistance program and does some other things. Um, comments? 
Yeah, you know, I voted for the bill, but I wasn't that enthusiastic about it. I mean, we it's an important issue that we should be addressing, but really they, they had a summer task force on this and it was kind of dominated by the developers. And so what they came up with was the idea that if, um, the, if the developers didn't have to pay for the infrastructure or the infrastructure is there, you know, your sewer lines and all that kind of good stuff, that that would, they wouldn't, they would re be able to reduce the price of housing because their costs would go down and that you could do that with this. Um, and so the state's going to have a grant program where you can get money to help put in these utilities in areas where there'll be um, new developments. Uh, I did vote for it because I, okay, we got to do something, but there are a couple of things that I'm a little skeptical about. One is there's nothing that really requires that the developers pass the cost savings along to the homeowners. So the question is, how will that really play out in the in the real marketplace? And then the other thing is they kind of layered in there that there's like a point system. And uh, if you can check off all the boxes on the list they created in the statute, then you can get 100% of the potential um, grant money that's out there. Um, the kinds of things that the boxes are is basically to reduce planning and zoning. So like if you agree to increase density, if you, I mean, some things that we've had quite um, significant debates on here in our own community, but they're basically saying if you do things that make your planning and zoning more friendly to um, people who want to develop housing, then you'll get more points and you'll get more money. So it's kind of a, a voluntary kind of carrot approach to trying to get communities to reduce their planning and zoning um, requirements. So I wasn't doing cartwheels about it, but it is voluntary and it's up to each community to decide whether they wanna um, participate in that. And we'll just have to see how it plays out. Senator Yoder, obviously you probably can't speak to the house bill, but anything on housing on the Senate side you wanna bring up? Real quickly, I was trying to find the, the bill because it did pass out of the Senate um uh it's a it's a bill that would create uh the ability to have residential tiffs but the the way the language was it um the task force that i'll, I'll look up the bill number but the task force that uh, matt is speaking about nowhere in the recommendations was this recommendation uh included and a part of this language says that school boards may be part of the discussion. And in other areas of Indiana code, school boards are always at the table. They, they, they are part of the decision-making of these TIFs. And this language said they may, but it wasn't required. And, you know, the author of the bill said, well, um, you know, it's, it doesn't, doesn't prohibit a school board from from, from uh, being part of the discussion if they feel like it's important for them to be at the table. And I feel that school boards need to be at the table. They, they should be part of this discussion because it's going to directly impact them. And so it was problematic, number one, that the first bill that we heard to address the housing crisis in Indiana didn't even come from the recommendations of the time and energy and expertise that went into the housing task force to begin with. So that was frustrating, but number two is to uh, take to not give uh, a seat at the table to our, our school our school boards and to consider how it's going to impact the school uh, corporations in uh, in Indiana is problematic. And so, just keep an eye out for that. I'm going to find out that bill and I'll put it in the chat the number. But you know, I we're fortunate because we have a good relationship with with our school. Our, our school corporation in our in in Monroe in Monroe County and also in Richmond Bloom you know, we have good relationships but that is not the case throughout Indiana and so I think it's important that they have a seat at the table I'll find that number and put it in the chat thank you senator uh we don't have any more questions does anybody from the league want to ask a question while we still have a few minutes Well, if not any, any uh, let's just do some final thoughts. Uh, Representative Pierce, while Senator Yoder is looking up that bill, do you have uh, any just anything we didn't didn't cover? Um, yeah, let me. Uh, oh yeah, let me just talk about the uh, one thousand eight, which is called the ESG bill. 
which is um, actually becoming kind of a humorous thing. So um, as you know, ESG is kind of a new thing in investing. It's like environmental, social, and governance issues. So the idea is that while you're thinking about where you would invest your money to get a return on your investment that will um, help you out, that at the same time you think about what those corporations are doing in the area of environment, social um, issues, and also their own kind of governance practices. And so, um, and it's become popular because, you know, if you pay attention to any of the marketing that comes to you from people who want to like, you know, manage your 401k and all that kind of stuff, you know, they, they talk about, hey, we've got these ESG funds. So they're kind of popular, I think, among investors. They would like to get a return and also be advancing, you know, some um, causes that they care about. Well, for um, many of our Republican friends, this is like a horrible thing. And last year, they attempted to pass a bill that would essentially say that if any bank or anybody had anything to do with promoting ESG as a consideration of investing, they couldn't do business with the state. The bankers went nuts and fought it off. So they came back this year with um, 1008, which makes it an official Republican priority bill. And it would say that the pension funds cannot um, use any companies to manage their investments that vote in shareholder meetings or do anything with their power. You know, if you're a big shareholder, you get to vote on um, proposals at the annual meeting and stuff. And so uh, what they basically said, and this really tells you something about the priorities of the Republican Party, if you have any like investment operation that when they have these shareholder votes, if they vote for anything that would combat greenhouse gases, promote civil rights in the areas of employment and uh, diversity and governance, if uh, any if they vote for anything to um, that deals with environmental standards, that attempts to um, punish or harm firearms or ammunition. Um, manufacturers or anything that would harm or try to divest from fossil fuel companies, timber mining, or other mineral extraction companies. And so what this bill would say is like, okay, um, perf, turf, you state pension people, when you decide, you know, these big Wall Street firms that are going to be managing your money, you have to monitor and make sure that none of them vote for any of this stuff that would harm the firearms manufacturers or the fossil fuel companies, among other things, or promote civil rights or environmental um, issues. And uh, so the argument was you should be strictly focused on your fiduciary duty to provide the best return possible for the retirees so they can have as large a pension as possible. And you should not um, consider any other factor. Well, the irony is, there is an updated fiscal impact statement of what 1008, what impact it would have on the pension fund. And this was after talking to PERF and TURF. And what they found is that uh, if 10,008, 1008 becomes law, it will have a $6.7 billion impact, a loss to the pensions. So I think that probably we're not going to hear from HB um, 1008 ever again. I'm thinking it's probably going to float out to sea because they're kind of stuck now. Their whole argument was these crazy woke ESG people are costing us money and uh, we got to keep everybody focused on the fiduciary aspect of this management. But now the fiscal impact shows that just having to do all the bureaucracy and not invest in certain funds was going to cost them about $6.7 billion. So they're going to have a hard time overcoming that. The state uh, chamber has also been really roundly against that particular piece of legislation. Uh, Shelley, final thoughts. Thank you, Chris. I would say my first session back in 2021, I filed a bill to uh, create, uh, just to codify an Indiana law, uh, protections for classifications uh, that currently don't have, aren't, specified in Indiana law for protections when it comes to um, discrimination in schools. That is gender, gender identity, and oddly enough, marital status. So, uh, and I was at, you know, the ACLU very, you know, kindly and respectfully said, can you not make a lot of noise about that? Because right now it's actually good for our trans community. 
Um, there's just not a lot of attention and it's good not to bring attention. Uh, that was 2021. In 2023, we have 14 bills that were filed that it directly impact gender affirming care. Uh, how, if, if somebody changes their attire at school, it needs to, you know, the teacher needs to uh, report that. If uh, a, a student wants to change their name, uh, that needs to be reported uh, immediately. And so that's how quickly, you know, things have moved in two years. But I'm very alarmed by the number of bills that are othering and anti-trans uh, for members of our community, of uh, their the individuals and their families, how they are targeting. Just a couple of bills to keep in mind. Senate Bill 480 is a health care bill, and it would it would um, prohibit a minor under the age of 18 from pretty much seeking any gender affirming care. And uh, Senate Bill 354 is an education bill. And that's the bill that would require teachers to report if a student changes their attire, if they request to be called by a different name. Of course, the pronouns, very scary, but if they want to request different pronouns, it has to be reported. So those are the two bills that I'm keeping an eye out for. I know, I think there's one that's sort of making some noise and, and has, some movement in the house, maybe Matt can, is it, uh, which bill is 14, uh, let's see here, what is that bill number, maybe 1407, I think it did pass out of the house, um, maybe you could speak to that a little bit, but, you know, at a time when uh, our trans community already feels like there's a target on their back, and for trans children and their families, uh, to feel that the state is really coming after them. It has to, it, it is terrifying. And we should all, you know, just keep an eye out for those bills. Do what you can to your use your voice, your activism to be an ally, to be an advocate, and to stand up for people uh, in the state of Indiana so we can keep this bad. Uh, policy uh, from becoming, you know, law in Indiana. So those are things I'm still concerned about. Yeah, so on the trans front, we did have Representative Mayfield has introduced House Bill 1569, and it did pass out a committee. And essentially, it would say that you could not, um, that DOC could not spend any money on gender reassignment surgery for any inmates. And um, the, originally, the bill said you also could not provide any hormonal therapy, but I think it became pretty clear to the committee, even before we had the meeting, that that would be unconstitutional because it's cruel and unusual punishment under the Constitution not to provide people with necessary medical care. So that's like the battle, right? Is, um, you know, uh, is uh, gender dysphoria, I think that's the term but is treatment of that, is that medically necessary or is it not? And this is where you get into the politics of it because people have decided, I think, in the Republican party that there's lots of votes to be gotten by promoting this trans issue as some kind of crazy thing where we've invented something that doesn't really exist and we're brainwashing our kids to believe that they're a different sex than they really are and that this is getting out of some kind of crazy fad that's getting out of control. So we gotta like tamp it down. And I think like a lot of things in politics, when people don't um, maybe know trans people directly and they are kind of can't understand something and there's a little bit of fear in there, it's the same thing happened with um, same-sex marriage, right? So for about a decade, the Republicans made hay off the idea that our world as we know it would end if you allowed same-sex couples to get married. Well, today, it's overwhelmingly supported. Even Republicans voted to repeal the Defense of Marriage Act in Congress. So the world turned. So I think that we're in this horrible phase where beating up on trans people is good politics, at least for a particular base, uh, a voting base out there. And uh, that's what they're going for. Now, they got a little bit beaten up last time because they said, why are you picking on little kids when they did the trans athlete bill? You know, what, you know why are you bullying these little kids on this issue? So I think they decided like, oh, who will, who can we bully that people won't get mad about? Oh, let's go after the people in jail. You know, they don't have many friends. 
So we can go after them. So even though you've got maybe one or two people in all DOC out of the tens of thousands of people in there that you know might be um, asking for this um, type of treatment, it's like I said in committee, you know, of all of the issues that are facing our courts and our criminal justice system, this one is at the bottom of the list. And yet we're passing it through because they want to go campaign on that. They want to check that box off. And the other thing that was uh, a little bit frustrating in that committee is really no one showed up um, to provide either objective information about the health aspects around this issue or even advocates for the trans community. It, what we got was some written testimony and one person who said he was a medical doctor who showed up and basically said the surgery is not appropriate, it's detrimental, that it raises suicide rates. And uh, we had written testimony from someone saying like, you don't need the surgery because I'm really good at conversion therapy and we can actually just um, correct the problems um, through conversion treatment. And so there wasn't a very good discussion at all in the, in the committee. So that's kind of where we are on trans issues in general. Thank you, Representative Pierce. Uh, if we wanna get that last slide up, I can ask a question that we've gotten from Jim Cook regarding uh, the lack of Republican legislators here uh, this morning. Every, every legislator is asked the, the same way. And I did uh, speak with Representative Dave Hall of 62, who represents all of Monroe or all of Brown County, uh, Jackson, and uh, some of Monroe. Uh, he had uh, an event today. He could not make it, but I do expect to see the representative sometime in a future League of Women Voters forum that we're having on this Saturdays. But that's always a good question to ask. We would love to see much more participation from that side of the aisle to get the supermajority's uh, perspective on things. I want to thank the legislators who did show up today, uh, Senator Yoder, Representative Matt Pierce, and all the attendees who took time out of their Saturday morning to join us with some legislative updates. I thought it was pretty informative. Um, you can find the at the Indiana General Assembly website uh, the bills and where they are at. Uh, please contact your local legislators if you have opinions that you care about. Uh, we'll be back with you Saturday, March 11th, same time, 9.30. Um, people who registered, you will have an update and receive emails with handouts from the co-sponsors. Um, I'd like to thank, first, again, our legislators who joined us today, um, those of us who uh, logged on, Community Access Television Services, which provides a great document of what we just went through um, we, what would we do without cats in our lives? And uh, of course, our team members here who helped out with the questions and setting this up, the League of Women Voters do an excellent job. So thank you to our sponsors, the League of Women Voters, Bloomington, Monroe County, and the League from Brown County, uh, the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, and the Brown County Chamber of Commerce. I think all of you have a rest of your great Saturday morning. We'll see you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you.